Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Apostolic Fathers. The writings of the Apostolic Fathers, uh, first of all, we're going to look at epistles. Uh, you have First Clement, uh, he's writing from the Church of Rome to the Church at Corinth. Uh, you have Second Clement, that's an anonymous sermon, uh, so it's not necessarily written by Clement, even First Clement, even though um, it bears his name. Um, he's not mentioned by name in the epistle itself. The epistle is actually addressed from the church at Rome to the church at Corinth. Uh, we have an epistle called, entitled, in the title at least, uh, the epistle of Barnabas. He talks about Judaism and puts it in sort of a, a very negative light. Uh, you have a number of uh, seven epistles of Ignatius, uh, an epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, and a letter of Diognetus, which is an apology showing Christianity is superior to other religions. Now, you have some other writings that are not epistles. You have a writing about the death of Polycarp, which we will look at when we uh, look at the topic of martyrdom. We have a writing known as the Didache, the teachings, and this is a series of basic instructions. It reads a bit like a new Christians, a, a manual for new Christians. Uh, we have the writings of Papias that are only fragmentary, so no complete writings, and sometimes he's quoted by other sources. And then finally, the Shepherd of Hermes, which is a series, it's an uh, a piece of apocalyptic literature, and it's a series of visions of both the present and the future and, and things like that. Now, our timeline, uh, we've been, uh, we look at the first, uh, I'd say, 60, 70 years of the church, uh, beginning, of course, around 30 AD to, well, to 70 AD. In 70 AD, we have the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and, and Jerusalem itself uh, is destroyed, the fall of Jerusalem in 70. Uh, we have Peter and Paul who were put to death prior to that, sometime probably in the early to mid-60s, and John perhaps a bit later, uh, no later than about 95, but, but maybe earlier than this, where he writes uh, both his gospel account, his epistles, and the book of Revelation. Uh, some of the Others that we'll be speaking of, Clement of Rome, if he's the same Clement who's described in uh, Philippians, then he is a contemporary with Paul. Uh, in, in any case, he's writing still in that first century. So let's look at Clement. Uh, he dies, according to tradition, around 101 AD. All our dates are going to be AD. Uh, mentioned by Paul in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, and served as an overseer in the church of Rome. Now, you say, what's an overseer? That's like an elder, uh, an elder, overseer, two different terms, at least at this early date, for the same position, not necessarily a bishop. That's going to come just a bit later, but not that much further later. Uh, tradition ascribes to him, uh, an epistle to the Corinthians, and so we have uh, this op epistle. It's addressed, though, from the Church of Rome, doesn't have his name on it, and it's written to the church at Corinth. So if he's one of the overseers at Rome, he could well be uh, the one who is writing this epistle. The other writings, he's known from some other writings, or actually, actually this epistle is known from some other writings, but it was lost until the year 1627 when it was rediscovered. Uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople actually gave a manuscript of this epistle to the king, uh, to King James I of England, and it came known then to the church in the West. Uh, it was published in 1630. Here's a segment from that, from this epistle to the Corinthians. He says, Shameful, beloved, extremely shameful and unworthy of your training in Christ is the report that on account of one or two persons, the well-established and ancient church of the Corinthians is in revolt against the presbyters. You say, what's a presbyter? That's an elder. Uh, just the, the Greek for word for elder. So you had uh, elders and overseers, and, and initially these had been the same, just two different descriptions for the same office. And, and so evidently there was somebody, one or two people, who had led a church split, a revolt against the elders in the church of Corinth. When Paul had written to the church of Corinth, there had been problems of divisiveness, of disunity. Uh, apparently, there still were problems, maybe not the same, maybe they changed, but there were still the same sorts of problems of, of disunity within the church. 
He goes on to say, you have studied the Holy Scriptures, which are true and are of the Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unjust or fraudulent is written in them. So he's, he's basing his teachings upon the Scriptures. Now, what he's calling the Scriptures are probably the Old Testament Scriptures, even though they had some epistles of Paul. He goes on to make mention of the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. So by this time, those martyrdoms had already taken place. And he references the epistle to the Corinthians that Paul had written to them. Uh, His epistle is filled with Old Testament quotes and allusions, so it's evident that he is familiar with the Old Testament and quoting from it as his authority. Most of the New Testament books are also quoted. So not only does he know the Old Testament, he seems to know quite a bit of the New Testament gospels and epistles because not by now they, they have made the rounds. So we had Clement of Rome. Next, we're going to look at Justin Martyr. No, that's not his last name. That's because he's, he's going to be martyred. And so Justin Martyr, notice his birth is around 100, so he's born around the time that Clement is dying. Uh, so, uh, but, but because he's close enough, we're going to reckon him as being part of the, one of the apostolic fathers, not because he knows the apostles, but because he's around the same period. You know, he, he's born in Samaria, uh, has a pagan upbringing, and studied philosophy, but then he becomes a Christian, and he writes two apologies. You know, say, what's an apology? For what is he apologizing? Uh, An apology isn't about apologizing. The word apology means a defense. Uh, Apo is the word from, uh, logeo is from reason. So it's a reasoned defense of Christianity. And this first apology is dedicated to the Emperor Antonius Pius and to the Senate of Rome. So it's an official document to the Emperor and to the Senate. Uh, He also writes a dialogue with Trypho, who is a Jewish writer, and apparently they're writing back and forth, and he's he's defending Christianity to Typho and saying, uh, here's why Christianity uh, is a better way of looking at your scriptures. He challenges authorities to investigate Christianity. He says, take a look at us. Look at who we are. Look at what we teach. We can withstand your scrutiny. He answers the charge of atheism against the Christians. You say, well, why would the Christians be accused of atheism? Uh, Because they only have one God, and they have a God that you can't see. Uh, And so the the Romans thought, well, they must not have have any God at all. Um, And no, they're not denying the existence of of all gods. They're they're saying there's only one. Uh, And he also answers the charge of subversion against those who are looking for a heavenly kingdom. Uh, There were those who were saying, uh, you won't give your... You won't give your loyalty to the Roman emperor. That's true, he says. We have a higher loyalty, but we're commanded to to obey the authorities that are in place. And of course, Rome is the authority, so we're obeying the Roman emperor and we're paying our taxes. We're not rebelling. Uh, And so there there is no subversion uh, in the Christians against, uh, against the empire of Rome. In describing their practices, he says, on the day which is dedicated to the sun, by this time they are using uh, seven days in their week, uh, that had caught on from the Jews. Uh, But notice they're referring to the first day uh, as the day, what we call Sunday, the the day dedicated to the sun. All those who live in the cities or who dwell in the countryside gather in a common meeting. And as for as long as there is time, the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. So, Uh, So they would read the Gospels, and they would also read the writings of the prophets, that is, the Old Testament scriptures, of course. Uh, If they can't read Hebrew, and they can't, they're probably reading a Greek translation of this. Um, The the Gospels themselves were in Greek, but the Old Testament had been translated into the Greek, what we call the Septuagint. He goes on to say, Having concluded the prayers, we greet one another with a kiss. Then there is brought to the president of the brethren, and notice, by this time, the church is, has been following the example of the synagogue. The synagogue had a, had a president, somebody who sort of rules over the synagogue. So the church now has a president, likewise. Uh, there is brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of water uh, and of watered wine. Notice they, they're going to water down the wine a little bit. They, they don't want anyone getting drunk over the Lord's Supper. He says, we who valued above all else the acquisition of wealth and property now direct 
all that we have to a common fund, which is shared with every needy person. Remember how we read about this sort of thing taking place in Acts chapter 2, where the early believers had all things in common. Justin says that wasn't just for Acts chapter 2, that's for us as well, and, and we do the same thing. We, we have a common fund, and, and everybody's needs are met. The next writing I want to speak of, of these apostolic writings, is known as the Didache. It was discovered in 1873 by uh, Philotheos uh, Brianus, the Archbishop of Constantinople. It was known from other writings, but we didn't have a copy of it. Uh, it had been known to Origen and to Athanasius, two of the early church fathers. Um, and its significance, when it was discovered, uh, everybody initially ignored it. Now, nobody really paid attention at first. But uh, eventually they did. The author is anonymous. We don't know who wrote it. It was a, a, a manual for new Christians, telling new Christians how they ought to believe, how they ought to act. You know, what do you do now that you're a Christian? And so it begins, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, there are two ways, one of life and one of death, but a great difference between the two ways. The way of life, then, is this. First, you shall love God who made you. Second, love your neighbor as yourself, and do not do to another what you would uh, not want done to you. Notice it puts it in sort of a negative sense, but, but it's telling you basically how to live now that you're a Christian. He goes on, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit uh, pederasty, uh, that is, sex with children, uh, you shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not practice magic, you shall not practice witchcraft, you shall not murder a child by abortion, yes, abortion was a thing back then, nor kill that which is born. You say they had to say that? Yes, that was actually something that was commonplace in the ancient world. If you if you had a child and you decided, eh, I don't think I like the way the child uh, looks, or I decided I only wanted a boy child, not a girl child, it was customary just to throw the baby out. You know how we have this expression, throw the baby out with the bathwater? They would literally do that. They'd, they'd take the baby and, and put it out you know, sometime, somewhere in the forest to either get along by itself or to be eaten by, by the wildlife, um, and they would kill the baby. But Christians were not to do that. They were not to do any of these things. Many of these things were just considered commonplace among uh, the pagans of Ro uh, the Roman and Greek world. But Christians were to live differently. He goes on to say, but on the Lord's day, after you have assembled together, break bread and give thanks, having in addition confessed your sins, that your sacrifice may be pure. And so uh, notice the, the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, was a regular part of the Christian meeting. Concerning baptism, I find this rather humorous, actually. Concerning baptism, thus baptized, having first recited all of these precepts, baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in running water. But, it goes on to say, but if you do not have running water, then baptize in some other water. And if you cannot baptize in cold, then do it in warm water. But if you have neither, then pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So notice, uh, the traditional way was to, to immerse someone in water. But if you couldn't do that, then, then just pour it upon them, and that counted as well. These were all legitimate forms of baptism, according to the Didache. Indeed, when we look at the way that baptism is depicted in art, the regular depictions, notice, don't, do not necessarily show somebody put, being immersed, but rather this sort of pouring or sprinkling uh, of that the water would identify with the individual and therefore identify them as a Christian. Baptism was the initiatory rite to become a Christian, similar to the way in Judaism that circumcision was the initiatory right to become recognized as a Jew. Now, the DDK goes on to give instructions about visiting prophets. That uh, uh, It regulates how long a prophet was allowed to stay. Uh, if a prophet came into town, he could stay two or three days. But longer than that, if he stays longer than that, then he's a false prophet. He's not allowed to ask for money. And it speaks of the election of both overseers 
and deacons. So by this time, the way they were getting their leadership, maybe going back to the book of Acts, we're we're not told entirely. Uh, I remember in Acts chapter 1 when it came time to choose a new apostle. They actually put two candidates forward and then said, Lord, you choose. And they cast lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he became the replacement uh, replacement apostle. But by now, they seem to be doing elections of these overseers and deacons. So we've looked at Clement, we've looked at Justin, next we're going to see Ignatius, and also Polycarp, uh, two of the other apostolic fathers. First, Ignatius of Antioch, because there's going to be other people by the same name later on in church history. Uh, Supposedly, he had sat under the teaching of the Apostle John, or at least had some interaction with him. And he has become now the bishop that is the head overseer, Um, And notice by now you don't have just a number of overseers, but you've got one who is the sort of the head bishop, the the head overseer of the church at Antioch. Um, The phrase that is attributed to him, of course, he would say it in in Greek, not in, in English, but the closer the sword, the closer the Lord. And that speaks to the fact that he had been arrested and was condemned to death and was going to be taken to Rome where he was going to be put to death. Uh, So uh, he's on his way to be martyred, and he recognizes that, and he says, please don't try to talk anybody out of it. He says uh, in his epistle, and he writes seven epistles, one of them to the Ephesians, there is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh. Of course, he's talking about Jesus, uh, the one who is God existing in flesh. You ask the question, did he understand the divinity of Christ? Absolutely. Uh, true life and death, both of Mary and of God, first possible and then impossible, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. In an epistle to the Magnesians, he says, Take care to do all things in harmony with God, with the bishop presiding in the place of God, and with the presbyters in the place of the council of the apostles, and with the deacons who are most dear to me, entrusted with the business of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we had had the two offices, one of of elder overseer, which was two different descriptions of the same office, and then we'd had the deacons. By now, we are seeing through Ignatius, and he's not ordaining it, it's it's already taken place. Uh, He's describing it as a present reality. In his day, there were now three offices. There was was the bishop, uh, who was God's spokesman to the church for that particular church. And remember, there'd be bishops in many, you know, each church would have its bishop. Uh, and then there would be the, the presbyters, the word presbyter just means elder, the older guys, uh, the presbyters in the place of the Council of the Apostles, uh, and then also the, the deacons. So we have the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons, three different offices now into which the church has morphed. In speaking about his upcoming martyrdom, and here he is addressing uh, an epistle to the Romans, he says, Permit me to become food for the wild beasts, through whose instrumentality it will be granted me to attain to God. I am the wheat of God. Let me be ground by the teeth of the the wild beasts, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. I love the way his metaphors just roll from one to the other. Rather entice the wild beasts, that they they may become my tomb and may leave nothing of my body, so that when I have fallen asleep, I may be no trouble to anyone. Let them just eat me whole. That way you won't have to worry about having to bury my remains. Let my remains just be digested in their stomachs. Now, he warns against false teachers. He says to preach the the God of the law and the prophets, but uh, beware of those who who preach the God of the law and the prophets, but who deny Christ to be the Son of God. Apparently, there were some that were saying, uh, no, Jesus is, you know, just follow the law. Um, and he speaks against those. He also speaks those against those who confess Christ to be the Son of God, but who deny the God of the law and the prophets. Notice, two extremes. Uh, some who want to preach Judaism, but not Jesus. Some who want to preach Jesus, but not the Old Testament. Uh, and he also warns against those who confess Christ, but think that he was only a man. Uh, and here was a specific group known as the Ebionites, um, that, that were, you know, so different views already that were presented uh, in the ancient world about who Jesus was. 
he warns against those false teachers who confess the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but think that the incarnation was only an appearance. In other words, Jesus only seemed to be a human being. Uh, you know, uh, the belief, you know, yes, there was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, uh, Holy Spirit, but Jesus was an apparition, an appearance. Um, and then he warned against those who have correct views of Christ and God, but don't seek to live a holy lifestyle. In other words, you don't have to have merely the correct theology. You need the, the correct Christian life to go with that theology. He says it is absurd to have Jesus Christ on the lips and at the same time to practice Judaism. Christianity did not base its faith on Judaism, he says, but Judaism on Christianity. And, and the reason he's saying that, he's saying, look, Jesus pre-existed Abraham, so we're not basing our faith on Abraham. We're going back all the way to the, to the one who created. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and that's Jesus uh, who did that. Now, there were, as we've already um, um, made reference to some doctrinal disputes. So, the Ebionites I already mentioned, uh, they had an emphasis on following the Jewish customs, and they saw Jesus as only a man who was adopted by God in the same way you and I might be adopted by God, but he, he's, he's merely a human being. And then there were the Docetics, docetism from the Greek word dokeo, dokeo means to seem. Uh, these were the ones who taught that Jesus was divine and only seemed to be human. So the Ebionites said he only seemed to be God, he was really human. The Docetics, uh, he was really God, only seemed to be human. Uh, and, and so they're, they're coming at this from, from opposite angles. Next, I want to talk about Polycarp. And Polycarp writes a single epistle. Uh, he's going to suffer a martyr's death as well. And we're going to talk more about Polycarp's death in a future class. But he writes the epistle to the Philippians. Uh, and it involves a church leader, unnamed, who is in need of discipline. The issue, though, involves the misuse of money. And he calls for his repentance and for his removal from the office of the church. In other words, he can be a Christian, he can repent, but he can't be a leader in the church anymore. Uh, and so he refers to the collection of the epistles of Ignatius, who had already gone before him, who had been martyred before him, and who had written seven epistles. He says in his epistle to the Philippians, I was exceedingly grieved for Valens, this is the, the, um, the presbyter that I mentioned uh, a minute ago, who previously was a presbyter among you, because he is so ignorant of the office which was given him, I warn you therefore that you refrain from covetousness, apparently that was his problem, he, he wanted stuff, he wanted money, that you be pure and truthful. He goes on to say, for everyone who shall not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is antichrist, and whoever shall not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil, and whoever shall pervert the oracles of the Lord to his own lusts and say there is neither resurrection nor judgment, that man is the firstborn of Satan. Now notice that last term that he uses, the firstborn of Satan. He doesn't mean that that's the first person that Satan ever brought around, but rather that he is the preeminent one representing Satan. When we see that idea of firstborn of somebody, it's the idea of firstborn. We see that phrase used in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus, for example, is the firstborn from the dead. That doesn't mean he was the first to ever rise from the dead. Uh, you actually have some people that he rose, uh, raised from the dead. Uh, but it means that he, his resurrection is the preeminent resurrection because of his resurrection, we will rise as well. Now, Second Clement, uh, probably not written by Clement, uh, the book itself is anonymous, it's not an epistle, uh, it's actually a sermon, and discovered in the same manuscript that contained First Clement, so hence it, it received that name of Second Clement. Uh, it quotes both the Old Testament and the words of Jesus and describes them both, not just the Old Testament, but the words of Jesus too, as scripture. So by this time, we're beginning to look at the Gospels and other writings and see them as scripture too. It also quotes from several non-canonical books. For example, it quotes from the Gospel of Peter and the, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas that had come up from Egypt. That's what Coptic means, Egypt. Um, next, we want to speak of Papias. Um, Papias had supposedly been a, a companion of 
of Polycarp, at least according to tradition. And we only have small portions of his writings, and the, the portions that we have are those that are quoted by Irenaeus and Eusebius. So we're learning from Papias secondhand, and the reports that we get from him um, aren't from his own words, but they're, uh, they're echoed by somebody else who has, who has reported upon them. Uh, for example, uh, this report comes that Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately everything that he remembered without, however, recording in order what was either said or done by Christ. Now, uh, did Papias say that? I'm assuming that he did, uh, because this this comes down both by Irenaeus and Eusebius. But we're getting, you know, how uh, you tell a story and then somebody else tells a story. It's one of those stories that's being passed down. He, with regard to Matthew, it's from Papias that, that we read, and again, passed down through these other sources, about how Matthew composed the oracles in the Hebrew language, that is the book of Matthew, originally written in Hebrew, and each one interpreted them as he could. So, um, now we don't have the book of Matthew in Hebrew. We only have it in Greek, and then, so that's what we have to go by. But according to tradition, it was originally written in, in Hebrew and then, and then translated, maybe by Matthew himself or maybe by others. Uh, Jerome speaks of Papias and said that, uh, notice Jerome is saying, he, that is Papias, is said to have taught the Jewish tradition of a millennium. And he is followed by Irenaeus, who also held to this idea, and Apollinarius, and others who say that after the res resurrection of the Lord, uh, that it, not after Jesus rose from the dead in the past, but uh, after the resurrection that Jesus will bring in the future when he returns, that the Lord will, after the resurrection, the Lord will return in the flesh with the saints. So this idea, and it's taken from Revelation chapter 20, um, but when Jerome is relating that, uh, Jerome doesn't doesn't take that view of the book of Revelation. He says, no, uh, Papias misunderstood it. Now, uh, whether Jerome was right or whether Papias was right, I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, but Jerome is reporting on some of the views that Papias held. Next, we speak of the epistle of Barnabas. Uh, now, it's named after the traveling companion of Paul. That doesn't mean that he wrote it. In fact, the epistle itself is anonymous. Uh, it's very anti-Jewish in nature, which makes me think that its author is not Barnabas. Uh, it describes Judaism as a false religion, and it says because the, the Jews broke God's covenant, they were not God's people. I'm not sure that Barnabas would have said it quite that way. Uh, he goes on to say God's covenant is for those who believe in God's Messiah. Uh, that, I think, uh, is something that Paul and others would have said. Here's a, a quote from that. It is not your present Sabbaths that are acceptable. He's speaking to the, to, to the Jewish people. But the Sabbath which I have made, in which when I have set all things at rest, I will make the beginning of the eighth day, which is the beginning of another world. Therefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing, in which also Jesus rose from the dead, and having been manifested, ascended into heaven. Notice, uh, they say, we don't, we, you know, the church doesn't meet on the first day of the week. We meet on the eighth day. You say, well, isn't that the first day of the week too? Yes, but, but it's the thing that comes after the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath was for the Old Testament believers, but now that the Messiah has come, we're in that next phase, we're in the eighth day. He also says, uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. You shall love your neighbor more than your own soul. You shall not murder a child by abortion. Notice that common theme with the DDK. Nor again, uh, shall not kill it when it is born, because both had to be said, because both were practiced uh, at that time in history. The final book we want to look at is The Shepherd of Hermas, uh, the visions of a prophet named Hermas, uh, supposedly given to him by an angel in the guise of a shepherd, hence the title about the shepherd, uh, mentioned in the Muratorian canon, we'll talk about this when we get to canonicity, as a book that does not date back to the apostles. So the Muratorian canon lists it, but then says, but it's more recent, so it's really not classed with the books that, that came via the apostles. It's apocalyptic in its genre, and it's written in three parts. Uh, there are five visions. That's part one. Part two, uh, there are ten commandments, not the, not the ten from the Old Testament. Uh, and there are twelve parables. 
In one of the visions, <laughs> Hermas sees his former mistress. Apparently, he had been a slave earlier in his life. Uh, and she was, uh, in this vision, she's bathing in the Tiber River, taking a bath. And he later sees her in heaven. And she says, I know what you were thinking back there when you saw me. You shouldn't have been having those lustful thoughts. Uh, and so he prays a prayer of repentance uh, and, and admits, yes, I shouldn't have been having those, those wrong thoughts. In another vision, he sees a tower being built, and it represents the church uh, built on water. That's signifying baptism, and the, and the stones are those who are worthy. They are the building blocks for this building that is being constructed. Uh, some of the stones are rejected. Reminds me of of the uh, the psalm that talks about the stones that the builders rejected. But it, it goes on to say has become the chief cornerstone. Well, these stones are rejected. Uh, and some can undergo torments and then finally be used in another place. Now, in closing, I want to note the, the apostolic fathers that we've been looking at and compare them to the reformers. With the apostolic fathers, they face a world that was steeped in polytheism and in pagan worship, people that had never heard the truth. The reformers, Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and others, when they come along, uh, they're going to be dealing with those who agree on the reliability of the scripture and the deity of Christ, uh, who are monotheistic, only believe in one God, a very different idea. Audience. With the Apostolic Fathers, their evangelistic concerns were over the paganism of the day. When we get to the Reformers, when we look at their evangelism, their evangelistic concerns are largely directed toward those who are part of the Roman Catholic Church, those that are already churched and need to understand that the salvation into which they've entered is by grace through faith. And this brings up the question, where should the what should be our major evangelistic concern today? Is it those that are facing paganism, like the Apostolic Fathers? Is it with the Reformers, those who are already churched? And I would suggest that it is a combination of both, but increasingly in our day and age, we are facing people that are not churched, that have a pagan outlook, and perhaps we're coming full circle to the world in which the Apostolic Fathers first gave the gospel. And maybe, just maybe, we can learn from their example.